Good evening, Namaskar, Adab, Satsrekal, and Shalom. <laughs> the main, I know Rachel has said it all, but the main reason I'm going to say something before talking to these three amazing, awesome filmmakers is the term Benji Brigade. Um, Mira coined it, and many moons ago, when I was running one of my film festivals, I called Gurinder to the stage. She wasn't there. But Mira came up and said, I'm a member of the, you know, I'll take it for the Benji Brigade. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's quite a term. And since then, it just stuck in my head. So we tried to do it last year. Unfortunately, fate didn't allow it. Um, we had a few accidents, but... You know, getting these three who are so busy and so crazy with one film going and another one coming on the way, etc., was quite a task. But here they are. Thank you, thank you. And especially, I want you all to specially thank you, thank them because they all have come in today for this thing. And they're all keeping their eyes open. Can we have Deepa's reel, please? You grew up in a film environment. Your father was a film distributor in Amritsar. You saw and enjoyed many commercial films as well as other forms of film. No art forms, just commercial. Just commercial, <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, that's even more creditable then because your films are a ferocious search for the truth. They've got, they, none of them are commercial, none of them are close to it. Um, your films are bold. They tackle subjects from being queer to child brides, widows, gangsters. You are very quiet but fierce in my mind. <laughs> your silences speak volumes. Um, Funny Boy is a gay sexual awakening. Fire exposes the hypocrisy of chauvinist men benefiting from outdated customs to rule their homes. Their wives stuck in loveless marriages find love and solace in each other. Anatomy of Violence explores the gang rape of a young girl in Delhi. Water institu institutionalizes widows, depicts the plight of an eight-year-old young child widow left to spend the rest of her life in an ashram with older widows. Heaven on earth, as we saw here. Yeah. A young bride comes to Canada for the first time in her life only to be a victim of domestic violence. Earth explores the horror of sectarian violence during the partition of India. Deepa, these are very, very different from the commercial films you watched growing up. What made the change in you? How did you make this 360-degree turn? Um, I saw the films I saw in Amritsar. Uh, I 
remember the first one was called Nagin. I mean, I, I grew up with them, but I didn't ever want to become a filmmaker because uh, every Friday was horrific. My father would depend on the box office. So this was something I didn't want to have anything to do with. And uh, I didn't, in fact. I, went, I did philosophy in university. And I was, in fact, going to uh, do my master's when, um, when a small uh, cinema house in, not cinema house, it was called a cinema workshop in Delhi, um, uh, said, please, could I help out? Because they didn't have a receptionist. They were friends of mine. So I said, sure. You know, I was waiting to see if I could get in in the university. And um, after two days, I was fired. Because uh, <laughs> Anil Srivastava, who is wonderful, said that I had a lousy way of communicating. So that was that. <laughs> So then he said, listen, why don't you learn how to edit and do... So that's how I started. It was a very small uh, place. Uh, I, started, I learned how to edit on a Steenbeck. I learned camera work. I learned uh, how to do sound on an Agra. And I thought this wasn't bad. And then he said, why don't you make a film, a three-minute film? And I said, what's it on? This was in Delhi. And he said, um, just go to this farmer here and here, just outside Delhi. And do a film on how wheat grows. I said, what? <laughs> that was a real challenge. And I think that that's what did it, in fact, because what the fuck? I mean, you know, how, how am I going to do this? So um, I went there, and there was this guy sitting, farmer sitting there on a charpai, smoking his hookah. And I said, maybe that's what I have to do, is to see him smoke his hookah, because there's nothing else to do. That's how wheat grows. Yeah, that's how wheat grows. You just wait. <laughs> It's true, Mira. <laughs> He's such a smart ass. <laughs> and, and, and that's that's how I got into film, actually. But I have to say, because I've known Deepa since I was born, I think. Yeah. She was the old, she was my older cousin sister, favorite cousin's best friend, and still is. And um, totally. yeah. and 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 she, she's saying all these sweet things, but the fact is that she was always the hippest, most stylish girl. She had white, white bell bottoms and chain belts before, oh. <laughs> before Twiggy even could think of them. And she was like epitome of style. In, in, in Amritsar where, you know, it was yeah. thick nalas and, you know, salwar kameezes. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so you, 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 you were definitely a very fl flash person. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's true, it's true. Um, did you start out thinking of a trilogy of those Earth, Fire and Water, or did it just develop as you made one and then you thought of another? Because both Fire and Water brought you a lot of grief in India from the censors, from random people. You have said, India gives me the stories, Canada gives me the freedom to tell them. Want to elaborate on that? Well, neither do now, so that's that. Oh. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm for hire, you know, really. <laughs> it's true, anyways. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. I am Sirat explores the life of a transgender young person with whom you made the film. It took TIFF, LGBT, anyone else who've seen it by storm. We have here in the States a kangaroo Supreme Court that has blocked protections for transgender people, which is very sad. But when and where did you meet Sirat? Why did you decide to make this film with her? She calls you Ma, which is very touching. Obviously, you're very close. Both of you shot the film on smartphones. Can you explain that? Um, I met Sirat. Uh, I was doing a series, in, a limited series in in Delhi called Lela, and Sirat was, um, was one of the performers in it, and I really liked her. She was, um, uh, she, I, I think I liked her because she was such a bad actor, and it didn't matter, <laughs> you know, and I thought, wow, look at that confidence, and it was great, you know. And uh, uh, I said, so, 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 there's something so sweet about her. You never thought about the box office scene. <laughs> no, 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 you don't if you have to use smartphones anyways. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, years later, she said, um, she asked me, and I always kept in touch with her. And whenever I'd go to Delhi, she'd be there and come and see me. And then she said one day that uh, 
uh, she asked me if I'd make a film on her. And I said, why? And she said, because maybe if, if her mother sees the film, she will uh, feel that it's all right to be transgender. And uh, that uh, really touched me. I mean, she lived with her mother in North Delhi in a, in a two bedroom, one bedroom flat. And her mother knew that she was transitioning, but just would not accept her. So, um, so I said, sure, let's see what you can do. And I said, okay, but you have to, you have to, you have to be the narrator and you tell us, tell me what you want to say and why, and I'll follow you doing that. So she did, and I actually was the second camera, just following her as she told her story. And uh, it was, we didn't have the money, we didn't have anything. I told uh, David that, and nobody wanted to finance it, of course. So, so we said, okay, let's just do it on our smartphones, and we did. But I think when I spoke to you last year when this was supposed to happen, you said something about um, one of you doing it filming vertically and the yeah, other one she was, horizontally. Yeah, just, to, just to make sure that it was different. Uh, she did all her filming um, vertically and I did it horizontally. And I even forget, you know, sometimes I do it vertically and she said, no, 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 don't do it that. It's okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, ma'am, director, I mean, you know. <laughs> okay. Many of your films are fraught with pain. You expose the core of each of these subjects, these lives. I know you're looking very sad, but it's true. Your films force audiences to confront <laughs> controversial issues. Oh, please. I can't, I can't bear controversy. I mean, well, <laughs> I just, I, I just don't go there. I mean, it's so boring and it's so dated and it's really irritating. So let's okay, not go there. Oh okay, my God. We're down with it. We're, mo we're moving on. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Arun, you can't do this. I'm supposed to be your friend, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll dump that. You made Midnight's Children mm -hmm. with Salman Rushdie. Mm -hmm. You are a screenwriter. Why did you ask Salman to do the screenplay? Um, also, the, the two of you collaborated on that film. Um, how, what was the process of the collaboration? Was it easy, difficult? Did you work on the whole film together? And also, I know that there were several cuts. It wasn't obviously not easy to do the whole book on, on film. Who made those cuts, both of you? He, you? Uh, no, I, I wanted to do the film and he was kind enough to say, absolutely go ahead and do it. And he sold us the rights for one dollar, which I thought was fantastic, I couldn't believe it. And um, then, uh, then it was a question of who's gonna write it. I mean, and I'd, re I'd read the, uh, the script of what he'd done when it was supposed to be um, a television series. And, uh, and I thought it was really good. Uh, but it, it was important that we both were coming from the same place. What we both thought was important, what wasn't, and what should be included, and what, was, what shouldn't be. And so I sort of hit upon this idea about, um, I, said, I asked him and said, let's just go, I'll go back to Toronto, you go back to New York, and just write down what you think the film should be point form you know, see from scene one to the end. And mm -hmm. um, he said, okay. And I said, on this date, let's just exchange emails and see where we are because we might not be on the same page. And if we aren't, there's no point in doing it. And luckily, we actually, when we, there were about like two points where we didn't agree, but everything else was actually very similar. It was, uh, he didn't rewrite the script. We didn't have to do anything. He was, and he didn't want to come, which I was really grateful for. He didn't want to come for the shooting which I thought was great. And, um, and so he was here and we were in Sri Lanka while we shot the film. It was, it was quite, it was a wonderful experience working with him because he's, an, he's a very generous man. And he, I think he respects, uh, he loves films and he loves these two films. I mean, so he's quite thrilled. I wish he was here because he would have loved to be here. You never know. <laughs> no, he's not here. Uh, he's in <laughs> London. <laughs> Maybe if, yeah, that's not why I'm saying all these nice things about him. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but uh, it, was, it was really, it was lovely working with him. You're currently working on a film adaptation of Mark Sukumoto's memoir, Forgiveness. A touching tale of two families scarred by the horrors of World War II and the Canadian government. 
finally finding healing and forgiveness. Can you talk to us about that? Not really. Why? <laughs> it's a know. film you're doing. But God. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely book, and Mark's written a great script, and it's about, uh, it's, you know, it's a lot like, actually, seriously, it's a lot like Earth. It's, lot, it's a lot like what's happening in the world today. It's all about, it's about sectarian war. It's about the division of, and what makes the other, the other. It's what's happening in Gaza, which breaks my heart. Um, it's what's happening God, I think in Lebanon right now. And uh, what we do when we don't recognize that we actually are all human beings, it sounds simplistic, but it's, it's a tough film to make. So that's why I don't want to talk too much about it. But think about that. Think about why internment camps happened to the Japanese in Canada who'd, been, who'd never even been to Japan. And uh, at the same time, the prisoner of wars that would that happened to, in Japanese camps, and how do you come together from a Japanese family and a white family? That's and it's it's not easy, but it's essential if you have to survive as as a human race. And that's what intrigues me. I think in making all films, how do we survive? Your next film is going to be Troy Lok. I thought Troy you just Lokia. said. But that you just said it was forgiveness. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> There's another. Film. Yeah, it's yeah, development. Many hours. Yeah. What? I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, no, 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 no. You can say whatever fine. you want. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. Okay. I want to know. It's about a Indian female serial killer. Oh God. What? What drew you to this story? I, I think anybody would be drawn to this story. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's based on a true story. It happened in the 1870s. Um, uh, a woman in, uh, in Calcutta uh, who was, um, was a serial killer. And uh, what made her a serial killer is what's fascinating. And, and how uh, actually she, she got to a point where she let herself be caught. And the whole... I mean, it's fascinating what makes somebody a serial killer, especially a woman in the 1870s. And, uh, and the relationship she developed with the only Indian detective in the English force it, at that point. And um, it's, uh, I'm just, I, I love the, the journey of trying to find out what made her kill. I don't know. It's a true story, so let's see what happens. Thank you. Okay. Can, can we have Mira's reel, please? I'm a black man born and raised in Mississippi. Ain't a damn thing you can tell me about struggle. What do you know about I know that you and your daughter ain't but a few shades from this right here. That I know. Now you get out of that goddamn bed and you fly that plane to Ireland. Or I swear to you, I will. You don't tell me. Can we be civil, Jim? You think you're the only person 
who's experienced injustice firsthand. I have a commitment to myself. Not at all. You remind me of everything that followed. Mira, you started out as an actor, then a photographer, then a documentary filmmaker, and finally got into feature films. Salam Bombay brilliantly empathizes with children surviving on the streets of Bombay, deprived of a true childhood of food or a permanent roof over their heads, still singing and dancing on the streets. Once again, typical of a Mira Nair film, even in the depths of misery, there's music, color, and even some joy. The end of the credits say, no guts, no glory, 52 days, 52 locations. What problem? No problem. <laughs> you did not have trained actors and instead got the street children to give you the authenticity of their lives. You have since put aside money from each of your films and established the Salam Balak Trust for ch street children around India. Why did you choose this subject? How did you get these kids to work with you, to act? How did you earn their trust? Are you still in touch with them? <laughs> well, firstly, I'm really pleased to be here and really pleased to be with my Benjis. I, 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 sh I should explain for the non Benjis out here that Benji growing up uh, in Delhi University was a derogatory term for those who were not cool, unlike the Mards uh, that I hope to be. <laughs> So it's the Benjis actually who have drawn me uh, all my life, uh, the people who are supposed to be on the margin. I, I am very happy and nowadays quite relieved to have grown up in socialist India. In the, in the, I grew up, I was born in 1957 in Bhubaneswar, Orissa, where even Indians did not know where that is. It was supposed to be backward, except it had 2,000 temples from amazing centuries before us. Um, and, you know, we grew up, um, as most of us have, I think, cheek by jowl with those who have and those who have nothing. And I grew up also in that socialist way, Nehruvian India, where you had two pairs of shoes, one to have party shoes and one to school shoes. And then we had the uniforms and then we had party dresses. <laughs> and uh, I have two older brothers. I'm a contraceptual blunder. I'm two months, uh, my, after t uh, my brother was born, two months later my mother found herself pregnant. Uh, and uh, so I grew up in the, uh, you know, with my brothers all the time and I love them, but, but I grew up needing to deserve an audience, which is uh, uh, very hard when you're a kid and your brothers just take it all. and. And, and uh, you know, I used to, they used to comb my hair, the ayah would comb my hair and I would start yelling. And they would yell before me, so I had to stop yelling. It was that kind of thing. <laughs> but I felt actually sort of uh, tongue in cheek neglected as a child because my, my brothers were always the ones who were my parents' focus. But it helped that I was a good student, very good student. I used to max exams and I didn't like myself for that, but I used to be, you know, I used to go and help other kids with homework in their schools, in their homes. And one of these I was thinking about today and what makes one what, what one is. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, helping a young friend uh, in her very hot afternoon, defense, you know, where the, where the army folk live, where her father was a major. Uh, with her homework, and one moment she stepped out and I was lying in her bed with her, my school uniform, and her father walked in with all his medals from whatever, colonel or brigadier, whatever he was, and decided to like practically lie on top of me. And I, I just was, I was 13, and I just flung him off myself, and I fought him, actually. And he was so embarrassed that he left, and I, left as well. But I remember that that was the seed that was about 25 years later 
that made Monsoon Wedding, you know, because we all have come up through these kinds of nuance and not so nuanced situations. And, you know, so my whole life, I have always, uh, without even realizing it, you know, kept these things always with me. I observe, I try to observe everything. And I, I, I actively observe, I love, uh, I love to know people's names. I love to, um, you know, engage with them. Anyway, so it's this engagement that finally found a, uh, I did, I did, I became an actor in, in sort of political street theater with Badal Shakar in Kolkata, very different uh, from the Punjabi life that we've all grown up with. I used to live with my mama in Cal. He was, a, uh, he was the head of Union Carbide, uh, bless his soul. And, um, and, and, you know, and he, and I would live in the nice uh, Alipur estates in the morning, but go to North Calcutta where Badalda lived and did my, you know, what the, my Punjabi relatives would call thele wali cheese kar rahi you know, which is like, you know, I'm a social worker in a khadi or whatever. But anyway, that was what got me all the time. But being an actor, as I was for about two to four years, um, did not, I felt that I would not have any control over my own creative being, that one day you could be rejected for your nose, one for this, one. then I became a director rejecting people for their noses, but that was different. <laughs> uh, but, you know, mostly, uh, so it, it, it definitely was uh, not uh, something I wanted to be in the hands of others for. I did, I did not know what my vision was, but I knew it was not only that. And I very, very, um, very, very, I was given a scholarship to Cambridge University when I finished senior Cambridge in, in India. And I really, I have to say, forgive, forgive any Britisher who's in this audience, but I really hated the British. And I uh, didn't want to go there. And so I went to Delhi University and I, and I worked mostly as an actor with Theatre Action Group and met a number of people who are actually all in my films. Lilette is uh, Dubey's, I, I just saw her briefly in Monsoon Wedding. She always p played the sex pot and I always played the boyfriend's mother. And <laughs> that was how I lived uh, for a few years. And uh, <laughs> serious. And, and, then, um, and then I cast them all, no. And, uh, uh, and so, but I applied very, very, uh, another story, but I won't go into it, for a scholarship to come to America. And uh, most of them lost or didn't give me enough money, but Harvard gave me a full scholarship, and I came here leaving my country for the first time. <laughs> Thank you, Harvard. Uh, when I was 18 and a half, 19. And at Harvard, who, which did not give credit for theater, although I played Antigone, I played, uh, you know, Evita Peron, I played a lot of, I acted a lot on Harvard stage, a lobe main stage, it was called. I, I stumbled into cinema vahite filmmaking, <laughs> taught at MIT actually at the time uh, with Ricky Leacock, who really originated with T Penny Baker the handheld camera, and the and the idea of seeing cinema vahite is the cinema of truth, the idea of seeing truth through a visual medium through camera, and I felt very lucky at the age of twenty to have found my home. You know, you have to be young and really uh, thick-skinned. I always say I have a heart of a poet, but the skin of an elephant, uh, which you have to be to make films. Uh, all of us will testify to that. Um, and, uh, th but that grabbed me as a way to work with people, work with that engagement, and, and make stories of their own lives. But cinema verite means to really live with the characters that you make a film for. So a film I made, India Cabaret, uh, with cabaret dancers for which my parents temporarily disowned me for about the exact six months that I lived with the strippers and was basically uh, mistaken for one, often. Um, yeah, they liked the, you know. Um, and so, <laughs> no dieting necessary. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but when you get into that life, you know, you are, firstly, life, is completely electric and unpredictable. It's infinitely, I feel, stranger and more powerful than fiction sometimes can be. Um, anyway, I, I made these films, uh, you know, so far from India, India Cabaret, um, and, and, and four or five others. And, and, uh, but, you know, and they did, they did make it. They went to festivals, they went to television. But I didn't have the audience that 
I didn't have the audience in the 80s, especially in India. My parents didn't see the film. You know, they said, what do you want to see in the documentary? The government of India produces X amount of tons of coal a day. So what do I see your documentary? <laughs> so now documentary is a whole other thing. But then it was very, very new to make something interesting. Um, so that was what led me to think of Salam Bombay, my first feature film, uh, as a feature film and not as a hit and run documentary that I would have ordinarily done. Uh, it was the kids who would, in a total reversal of roles in India Cabaret, these were strippers who would come home at night, I would come home with them. In the morning when they would wake up, the chai pao, the tea boys would come into their little tenements with hot tea. And, and, the, and the dancers would make them, would talk to them like they were the men who talked to them the night before. They would say, Nacho, Gao, they would talk like that, you know. <laughs> and these poor children would have like one I am a disco dancer, seriously tuneless <laughs> Bollywood song, but they would dance and give them tea. Anyway, this was one of the incidents, there were several others, that grabbed me about the street kids, about how nothing they have, but they had this desire to have almost a flamboyant childhood. And that, uh, that really got me. And uh, I asked my friend Suni Tarapurwala, who was also at Harvard with me, and she was a short story writer. I was uh, doing all these things. And we ended up you know, uh, befriending a gang in, uh, in, in Bombay, rag pickers, and basically lived with them for four months. And, um, and the idea was always, because of Cinema Vaithe, to always, to always use the kids, uh, you know, in their lives. A rich kid, uh, you know, just doesn't cut it. Uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and, you know, everything, the, the, heart, the hands, the feet, the, the, the eyes, what they have seen, what they dream about. Uh, you can't have people, you know, who don't live that life act, you know, certainly not. And I'm not interested in any case. So it began uh, an amalgam, which I think, without again realizing, I've sustained all my, in all my movies, of, of marrying what they call non-actors with real legends, you know? So, I mean, Irfan Khan was not a legend. It was his first film at that time of Salam Bombay. Uh, I, I found him an 18-year-old who died, a uh, wonderful actor in the National School of Drama. And I convinced him to please come and stay with me and, and be a part of this workshop with street kids. It just so happened that he was six, and, six foot three inches tall. And, and the street kids, all for malnourishment, reached his torso. So by the time we finished our six-week workshop, uh, they could not form literally a tableau that Ifan would fit in, literally a physical thing. And uh, I had to make one of my hardest calls and talk to Irfan and say, you know, I'm really sorry, but you can't play Salim because of this. And he understood, but he wept. And, and, and I had one scene only that I could offer him, which was the letter writer, the scribe he plays, where Chaipa writes a letter home to his mother and pays somebody to write it for him. And he's the writer. Um, anyway, I, I owed him big time. And 50, it took me 15 years to call him to play Ashok Ganguly in The Namesake. And, and, uh, and uh, he was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, we, we stayed friends, but it was The Namesake that uh, all those 15 years, but it was The Namesake that really brought him to much wider shores, you know, outside India. You know, he, he, he should have been, all of them should have been nominated for Oscars, but then again, we don't sometimes be, we're not the lucky ones who get campaigns. That's another story. But, but, um, it certainly opened his Hollywood career in a big, big way. And um, anyway, so that's one of my uh, one of my um, uh, my my, satisfa my satisfactions or one of my happinesses is li really having the eye to find people who don't think they can do something, but they can do it, and they can do it with such beauty and brilliance. Uh, several actors have come to, uh, have you know Tilotoma Shom or. Um, you know, uh, Shefali Shah, or, you know, all these people were, it was often the first time films for them, Vijay Raz. Uh, so many, so many actors, uh, you know, have sort of started with me, and uh, I really feel thrilled to see how, you know, even Denzel, it was his second film in Mississippi Masala. Um, and, uh, yeah, and he, he, I have to say, uh, astonishingly, because we just restored the film 30 years later, and now it's a theatrical release, and Criterion has it, and so on. But even, uh, but somebody told me, and I had no idea of this, that uh, Denzel is his only romantic 
film. It's only only oh. time he plays a romantic hero. And it is one of the sexier films, uh, I think, made. Uh, <laughs> other people say that, but it's true to me. Uh, and uh, anyway, so th I, I'm, I'm moving along, but, um, but that that's, how, uh, that's, that's how... But I, uh, you, you mentioned India Cabaret, yeah. and I wanted to ask you about that, yeah. because... You, you know, these, these women tricked themselves out and wore glitzy things and with these leering men every evening. And you lived with them. Mm -hmm. They let you into their lives. Why? How? Well, um, And you, you lived with them, ate with them, spent yeah. time with them? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, I always say whiskey was my best friend <laughs> <laughs> on India Cabaret because... The men would drink, and the owner of the club would drink, and it was at the, one of those moments I would say, you know, can I, can I stay here? You know, can I just like do this and that? And they didn't quite know what they were letting me in for. I mean, they didn't what they were getting in for, but that was something that did help because they would say yes to things that they probably should never have said. So once they said that, and I only came to that club because I loved Rekha and Rosie, these two women who were bawdy and one wanted to be sexy and the other one wanted to just told it like it is. I still quote Rekha all the time. She said to me, uh, you know, when I asked my nieces and nephews, like, you know, how is a boyfriend? So, so she, Rekha used to say, ek to pending mein rakha, ek to chalu hai. <laughs> You know, I was like, so often I say, ek ko pending mein rakha, ek chalu hai, like in our movies. You know, ek to pending hai. Oh, so many things Rekha taught me. Like, a lot of things, seriously. I'm not kidding, yeah. I can tell you jokes, but I want to hear Gurinder talking, so. Um, so We've got a few more for you. Yeah, yeah, oh, no, no, so okay. anyway, so it happened like that. Okay. Yeah. Monsoon wedding epitomizes your spirit of energy, color, and fun. Of course, it's always fun with you. Um, all, despite the surface celebrations, you have skillfully woven in the unspoken atrocity of an oldest relative, sexual predator, taking advantage of a younger female member of the family, but that, you know, you saw that firsthand with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have taken Monsoon Wedding to the stage yeah. in mm -hmm. the last couple of years. Is it now going to Broadway? Does the stage still excite you to act or to direct? How do you react to a stage production as opposed to your years in film? Well, somebody told me that making a musical, and Gurinder will also talk about it because she made a wonderful Bend It Like Beckham on, on, in the West End. Somebody told me that making a musical Broadway-esque, it's a real American form, is the American form of musical, uh, is like the hardest thing you'll ever do. And I said, TK, TK, I'm like a bulldozer. I just, if I want to do something, I, it doesn't matter what people say, I do it, you know? <laughs> but it has been the most difficult. I would say even more than a film. I'm, I long to return to film because film is, I'm, I'm very assured of myself and now, and I can make them. But with, with, with the, the stage, especially the way we made it, um, it is like, um, it's, what I love about the stage is that it's always live. It's always for the first and the only time. It's absolutely ephemeral. You see it, what you see now, you'll never see again. And that kind of almost Zen approach to something like yeah. that you create is a beautiful thing. I mean, in the movies, we work so hard to immortalize something, and then it'll stay put where it is, you know. But in the stage, I mean, the, the lead actor had a concussion, in fact, uh, on stage. Or the curtain fell on her once. And, and it was like we had to deal with, you know, replacing her, whatever, whatever had to happen had to happen. Anyway, the stage is, is, um, it, it has been a challenge, uh, but a beautiful one. And it, we did very well when we opened off Broadway last yeah. year in, uh, in um, St. Anne's. Um, and now we are preparing because it has been, in the commercial sense, very successful already in the three times we've shown it, really as almost experiments to make it final. Now we are at the final stage, wow. and we are opening our, our desire, our plan is to open actually in the West End at the end of next year first, and then come back to America. We are concerned about Broadway because Broadway is still... Mm -hmm. COVID, uh, you know, it's still not working at an absolute peak capacity and it is so expensive that I'd rather come here when it's absolutely at peak. 
so we are opening in London, and then we'll open in India, and then, inshallah, we'll come to America. But I mean, I'm 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 happy we did it. I I also wanted to do it not with the roster of Tony Award winners who had done it several times before. I wanted to do it with my own people, and uh, that's part of the beauty and the challenge of it. So I went and asked Vishal Bhardwaj, who's a great composer, a music director, to write the songs, and and uh, you know Sabrina and Arpita Dhawan, who wrote the screenplay of the film, as well as Arpita Mukherjee, who then. Uh, also joined her to to write the script. So I, I wanted to work with our own folk, you know, who who would not look at, who would not make it uh, like exactly like an American musical, but keep the seed of authenticity and fun and bilingualism and all of that alive. And that has been a, a, its beautiful challenge. Yeah. And it's all, it, but it's it's all good now. But it cost me, you know, many years of not making movies because I was working so hard Honest. on the on the musical. <laughs> um, and I'm very happy that it's set. And now I have other people who will mount it for me because we have it, you know. But and I'm making. I'm desperate to return to movies. Yeah. Displacement. Oh, wow. being stuck between two worlds. Migration, rebellion across racial barriers are subjects both in the namesake and in Mississippi Masala. In the namesake, Gogol, the son of Indian immigrants, wants to assimilate with his peers in the US, but is torn by his respect for his parents' tradition, his heritage, and then his American friends and way of life. In Mississippi Masala, Mina and her family have just moved from Uganda to America, where she falls in love with a young black carpet cleaner, causing an uproar over racial, communal, and community barriers. Have you personally experienced displacement, racial barriers? I experienced such displacement. <laughs> I just came from India this morning. You know. <laughs> Total displacement. Um, um, of course, you know, I, I actually think that cinema uh, portrays or captures displacement or exile or this between worlds, the seesaw between worlds, more potently than fiction can also, because it's such a, you look outside your window and you, instead of seeing the Hudson River, you remember the garden in Kampala. It, it happens to me all the time, and I understand this as a kind of music almost, you know. Um, and and uh, so it's not my entire and only theme, but it's something I deeply understand and 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 embellish also visualize also um so yeah I, I that's why i make those films um uh, with mississippi masala it was really also to explore the what i felt like as a student at harvard being brown between black and white what this sort of hierarchy of color and i wanted to find and it was really just like that i found a place in Uganda, I'd never been to the continent of Africa, where Asians who had lived there for three generations were suddenly asked to leave by Idi Amin, given 90 days, um, you know, uh, based on the color of their skin, but much more deeper than that, based because they were the money, they were the money, they were the mercantile face of so much, and uh, between the British and the, and the Ugandan Africans. And anyway, it took me to Uganda. Uh, to explore this idea. And then in India abroad, we have that lovely paper that still comes out. You know, in <laughs> India abroad, they told me, that they, there was an article about how Ugandan Asian exiles had come to dirt poor Mississippi to buy these motels, and now you couldn't find an American-owned motel. And I thought that was extraordinary, because Mississippi is the birthplace of so much, ex especially the civil rights movement. So I, I put those two ideas together. What if an Asian family from Uganda comes to Mississippi, and 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 the borders are crossed by love, and and uh, that's what led me to Uganda, which uh, then to investigate, to research. Those days, I mean, Salam Bombay, Mississippi, so many films. Before I started adapting novels that exist, like The Namesake or Vanity Fair, and so on. Those days, all my films came out of like a real social science research type of one year of research one year of writing, and then we shot, you know? So th these things are all coming. Uh, so Mississippi Masala came out of that, and in the process, changed my life, and now I live in Uganda for the last, since I made Mississippi Masala. We, we made it actually in our home. Uh, the, the home that Jaimini Patel, Roshan ah, Sait yeah. leaves, 
is actually where my son was born and where we live. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So yeah, and where he's going to get married. <laughs> <laughs> You have set up Maisha Film Lab, Film Lab in Kampala, where you train young Ugandan directors to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. Your film, Queen of Katwe, was based on the story of a young Ugandan chess prodigy. Was there already a film community in Uganda, or did you start the ball rolling? Well, in truth, there wasn't a, a, a film community at all, because there's simply no training in the continent, I mean, in South Africa there is, in West Africa there is, but certainly not in East Africa. And this is a country and a tradition that has a rich oral tradition, like India has, and like, you know, incredible storytellers, incredible music, incredible ways of communicating the myths of the past and the present, but no filmmaking. And because I had like an ankle, I like to say, in Hollywood, and because I, they knew I was in East Africa, a lot of the very few films that come about based in Africa, usually about white neurosis on safari, you know, with Maasai nameless, <laughs> nameless, faceless, cultural Africans in the horizon. Those kinds of films would come to me, and I would be amazed at how different and how nothing, they had nothing to do with what the reality of living there, you know. And that's what, and everything from Biko, you know, it was about Donald Woods. I mean, there's nothing about really who we are there, you know. And that's what led me to make Maisha. Maisha is a Swahili word which means zest for life. Um, and all my, you know, even now I mentor a lot of people, but then I used to be a mentor at Sundance and at Moondance and Moonstone and just always trying to study the systems that one could then bring home, not to Uganda, I didn't even know I was going to Uganda then, but to where one is actually, you know. And so we set up Maisha 16 years ago with an amazing group of people, Lydia Pilcher, my producing partner, Sophia Coppola was on the board and Spike Lee and various people who could help me do it, and but a lot of people locally. And then we set up a free school and we we, uh, we, and the whole idea, and, and I believe that people want to do good. You just have to give them a platform to do good. So uh, I, wherever I would meet a director that I admired, you know, from Stephen Frears to Abderrahman Sisako to, to, you know, Vishal, of course, and, and so many people, Joshua Marsden was there, um, uh, Giankilo Esposito ran the thing, Barry Brown, and any people that I know and love and work with, I ask them to come and be the artistic director or to be the editing consultant, whatever, you know? And they would always say yes. So it would, it would, didn't, uh, you didn't ask, I'm so what? sorry. I didn't ask you, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> sorry, sweetheart. I didn't meet you enough. Anyway, and, 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 uh, but we did, we put it together like that and, and, and we really have, have uh, what about a thousand plus <laughs> alumni and and about um, twenty eight fully fledged film feature directors. We also we also uh, look at students from Uganda, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and Kenya. So it's four 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 countries. But I have to say that. Um, and also last year, I think this year, the first Maisha student got nominated for an Oscar for Bobby Wine. Oh. Yeah, yeah, which was great, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was a really amazing moment. Yeah. He made the, the People's President Bobby Wine a documentary that was nominated. Um, and, but, and after COVID, I must say, it became harder and harder to raise, uh, you know, uh, $500,000 a year to run this big school, which was entirely free for the students, and they lived there and all that. Took, took, you know, after COVID, all these sources dried up, and Uganda also became very uh, sort of wealthier. And we had made so many directors that I wound it up, I'm winding it up oh. to make it much more of a creative community space than a film school. Uh, it is a I mean, f film is now really entrenched uh, in Uganda. Uh, all the television, everyone, anyone, anything that's going on, they're usually an alumni of Maisha. And, and whenever I go in, in odd places and whenever I feel a bit defeated, someday uh, somebody will emerge from an alley seriously and say, hey, uh, I was in Maisha, you were the beacon. Not me only, the school. You know, somebody was listening to us. And that's a beautiful feeling. Yeah. 
So I've now done my best. <laughs> Amri, an experimental portrait of artist Amrita Shergil mm -hmm. is your next film, That's right? right? Have you started work on it? When do you expect to? Well, um, my, my Samudrika Arora is here, my partner and producer. We've been working on this for four years on Amrita oh. Shergil. We have the rights to her diaries and her paintings, and she had the most extraordinary life. Uh, she was born in Hungary to a Hungarian mother and a Sardar father. So she lived in this <laughs> east-west uh, tightrope for all her life, and her art, eventually she returns to India in mm -hmm. 20, and her art really reflects how it is changed by India, and the, the gaze that she brought to it was also remarkable. And I have uh, been influenced by Amrita Shergill's work and her color and her framing and her bravery of how to see in literally all my films. Uh, I make these lookbooks before I shoot anything, and with every lookbook from Salam Bombay to Queen of Katwe, I have Amri as a reference in several ways. Uh, because she was radical and she was uh, unique. And because I, again, like displacement, understand how it is to live between East and West and to make one's own voice between that, in that way, you know, uh, I feel like I'm suited to make Amri. Um, it's, it's been, it's very hard to convince anyone to finance for Amri because they don't know her that the way they know Frida Kahlo. And they, she will be known as Frida Kahlo is now when we finish with this, I'm, I'm sure. Also, her art is restricted to being in India, so it's not often seen abroad. And that's a problem, but that will change. Uh, so I am uh, very keen. Uh, we are, we are, yes, I've been working on it, writing it, doing this and that. And now we are set in October, November to start prep and shoot in, uh, inshallah, end of January, February. So by next year, uh, I hope that I'll be sitting here with Amri paintings behind this me. Super. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Last question for Mira before Come on, we move Kurinder on. Kurinder is waiting. Uh, she is... Mira, your son Zoran was oh. born in Uganda. Correct. Is currently a hot young politician here. Uh, hot, is it? Uh, your <laughs> husband. <laughs> Your husband, Mahmood, divides his time between teaching in Uganda and New York. You have homes in Delhi, Kampala, and New York. Where is your heart? Well, actually, there's a beautiful line in Mississippi Masala, which is very true for me, which is, home is where the heart is. And my heart is with that guy over there somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and, you know... Uh, uh, for me, it's really about um, full, fullest engagement that creates my home. So it's not like I, when I'm here, I'm here fully. I'm not dreaming of, of things in India or dreaming of things in Kabbalah. The one other thing that we are privileged enough is we have three really living homes in these countries. And I just slip into it and, you know, we work and so on. Of course, the ties of family are are what are what are the what is the ache you know the ache of seeing my mother grow older and older and you know so i've so that's the seesaw uh, but um home is really where the heart is i i don't i don't subscribe to nostalgia it's a useless uh, emotion <laughs> uh, i i subscribe to engagement and i and 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 to being fully present and and that is my home Thank you. <laughs> Gurinder's real, please. Yes. yes. <laughs> Really good. Yeah, almost as good as a man. <laughs> Mrs. Bamra, you must be very proud of your daughter. Not at all. And you three shouldn't encourage her. We have been given a new beginning. We must forget the past. News of my arrival has traveled so quickly. If anybody sees you or knows you're here, it could ruin everything. 
I'm a hopeless dancer, but well, this looks like you just screw in a light bulb with one hand, you pet the dog with the other. Such a clever, bright girl, Georgia. Have a look at this. I really don't need to learn about astronomy right now. Nations are rarely born in peace. It's got to be a clean cut. It's a bloody axe cleaving right through people's lives. We came to give India back our freedom, not to tear her apart. The curry killer appears to remain at large while the police have no idea who it is. Why did you do it? You said too fat, and you said she's ugly. You all got what you deserve. This Thanksgiving, <gasps> give thanks. Amen. My favorite part about Thanksgiving is knowing I can eat this tomorrow. Give grief. Uh, if I had a dollar for every time Ronald said y'all was coming, I'd be as rich as Oprah. Give in. Is it low fat? <laughs> and get out as quick as you can. I didn't know music could be like that. It's like Bruce knows everything I've ever felt, everything I've ever wanted. That's what you call real music. Springsteen. He's more what your dad listens to. Not my dad. Gurinder, your family... Thank in... God I can look at you now and hear. Gurinder, I have a Listening to Meera. <laughs> Make your chair like this. Oh. Put your chair over. Anyway, it was so interesting listening to both Deepa and Meera because we don't often get to... Well, we never share a stage. We've never sat with each other like this. <laughs> so it's so interesting. So now they listen to you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good in there. Your family immigrated to Britain from Kenya while you were still very young. Yeah. Um, you saw and faced racial discrimination firsthand while growing up in London. Several of your films address social and emotional issues faced by immigrants caught between two worlds, dealing with the duality of identity, Indian and British. Racial stereotypes, Immigration, gender role, immigration, gender roles, issues of prejudice against race and sexuality. Bhaji on the Beach depicts the trials of Indian women living in the UK, reconciling their converging traditional and modern cultures. Bend It Like Beckham shows us a strict Indian family who bans their young daughter from playing soccer, forcing her to hide her activities and her feelings for her coach. Blinded by the light, a Pakistani teenager experiences racial and economic turmoil in his neighborhood. His friend helps him escape the local intolerance and his family's traditional attitudes by exposing him to the music of Bruce Springsteen. Each of these films entertain and simultaneously speak of these trials. Do you feel your own life and experience as an immigrant to Britain set much of this activism in motion? Well, I think what's interesting is your analysis of the films oh. is very Eurocentric, if I might say so, uh, because you didn't use the word celebration once. Oh, and for me, no, no, it's an interesting point, because the, po the reason why I started making films is because I was being, uh, I saw things being made in Britain that were exactly how you described them. They were sort of uh, like pro in the problematic, the immigrant experience <laughs> caught between two cultures. <laughs> this is the terminology. And I set out to throw that out and celebrate our lives while at the same time, <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to be churlish, but it's a good point to make because people... Not at all. You put me in my place. Well, <laughs> no, but you've also... This is what you've probably read in Wikipedia or something because <laughs> that's how people define us. They define us in ways that we don't define ourselves. 
And so for me, everything I do is about celebration, but at the same time, it's still telling you that these things are happening. But growing up in Britain, it was a, a culture of dichotomies. It was a, cult a binary culture. You were either white or of color, or you were either traditional or westernized. You know, that this is how people perceive you. And this is how the media perceived us and other people making films about us or the, whenever they did occur, very few. They were generally about girls having to run away from strict fathers who were trying to marry them off. And, uh, and so they were never allowed to be Indian again. They had to choose the West. And I grew up in that environment and I was like, well, that's not me. I didn't have to do that. I was always able to do you know, I knew when to speak Punjabi, for example, and when to, how to be, you know, a punk rocker or into the specials as I was, you know, with my English friends. Uh, I would be one minute, in fact, it was uh, Deepa's, uh, when Deepa made Sam and me, my, one of my shorts played before her yeah. film, that's how I met her, and I was in Cannes with her uh, yeah. uh, on the boat, remember? Yeah, after her film, she had a party on the boat. That next day, I flew home and I was in the Gurdwara in Hounslow, <laughs> you know, making rotis <laughs> for my friends, uh, for my one of my relatives' parts. So our lives are much more richer than people describe them. And so, for me, my challenge. <laughs> I don't mean to be mean, but you set me up. So, um, so my whole thing is to challenge everything like that. So if you say you can either be this or that, I say, let me show you 20 things I can be. Let me show you how to be Muslim and love Bruce Springsteen. Let me show you how to be Punjabi, not want to cook rotis, but really bend a ball like David Beckham. Let me show you the differences that make up the, our enriched lives uh, when we're part of a diaspora, because nobody is articulating that. And one of the things often that happens is, you know, I'm, I know Mira has this, uh, people often come up to me and say, oh, I loved your monsoon wedding. <laughs> and I give them the same treatment I just gave you. Uh, and I know people have come up to Mira and talked talk to her about Bender like Beckham as well. <laughs> And it's interesting because, again, you know, pe our own people get us mixed up, you Next know. Was a, the elevator door opened in Amsterdam airport and somebody said, oh, Deepa Nair. <laughs> <laughs> Two in one. <laughs> I'm given autographs that say Deepa Nair. <laughs> yeah. But when people say that, it's the thing, the difference, I find with myself and these wonderful women sitting here with me is that they were both born and raised in India and they had their formative years in India. So in Indian nurse and Indian nurse from India is always present in their gaze and their storytelling mm. and their choice of films, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas I was never in India I was never grew up in India. I never. I used to visit India. I used to visit my grandmother, and I used to. I, the first time I went, I was six, and I refused to eat Indian food. And my poor grandmother had to make me chips every day, <laughs> and she even got that wrong because she used to cut them gol gol, you know. <laughs> and I'd throw a huge fit and say everything's broken, nothing works, <laughs> and she had to pay a hundred rupees to buy a bottle of ketchup. I remember for me. So I was terrible at age six because I was British, right? But then a few months down the line, I went to, into a school in, it was in Jagadri, where all the refugees were. <laughs> oh, yeah. So my mum had gone for three months to be with her parents and so she took me. So that I was put into a local school and all, and I had to learn Hindi while, but the kids were learning English, so I knew all the English, I didn't know any Hindi. Anyway, um, but, there, but what was interesting, I did Indian dance, you know. So I learned Indian dance and I did all this, da, de, 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 all that, you know. But as soon as I went home, I refused to do it. And I refused, I said, no, I'm not doing that because I'm not that kind of Indian. So interestingly, but I was only seven at that point. 
<laughs> now it's different. You know, my grandmother came to live with us when we were 13, um, when I was uh, 13. And then from her, I learned Punjabi. And now probably the most important thing in my life is the fact that I can speak Punjabi fluently. And it is a porthole to everything. And my regret is that my children don't speak it as, as, as well as I would like to. They speak little bits. But, you know, they're always like, you know, my son is like, Mom, please don't put on that ding a ding music, you know. <laughs> I'm like, how dare you? <laughs> He's like, well, it's annoying, Mum, and it all sounds the same. Um, so that's a tragedy for me. But I'll still persist on that, because knowing your mother tongue is important, which is why so many of my films are bilingual. But they're always through this gaze of the diaspora, and that's mm. kind of the difference. But it's still Punjabi. It's Punjabi mm -hmm. in a different way. Um, I went back to India when I was 18, 19. I had a gap year. And, uh, and I was with a, stayed with an aunt in Delhi, in Jangpura, <laughs> uh, my Amritanti, who's still alive. And um, she was scared to let me out of the house. Uh, I had gone to intern at a magazine called Minushi. Remember Minushi? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had gone to uh, work. I was work, uh, working there, basically. And, but my aunt was, would drop me or pick me out. She wouldn't let me take an auto scooter. She was really scared, because at the time, girls were getting kidnapped uh, in, in Delhi. And um, so I found it very restricting, and I again, had this love affair with India where I was like, you know, I really don't belong here. This, you know, I have no freedom here, you know, compared to London. Um, and then my aunt sat me down and gave me a very strong lecture about colonialism and said, <laughs> you know, for 60 years, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I always remember that lecture. <laughs> so, you know, and she was right. It's a young country, you know, finding its feet. So I, I had that version of India, my aunt's version coming at me. I also had cousins in India, very close to me. Cousins, Navpreet, Satpal, uh, Kamal, and they're all army, navy kids, you know, <laughs> and they loved to listen to heavy metal, which I found so weird. And Uriah Heep and all this kind of music, uh, but they were Westernized in a completely different way mm. to the way that I was Westernized. And then I went to spend time in Amritsar <laughs> with other cousins of cousins on Mal Road, and um, these g girls were fantastic. They'd just come back from Chandigarh. Uh, their father was very wealthy. The Chandigarh University, and they wanted to do something with their lives. But the community was very sort of down on them. And, and they set up a school and they set up a block printing factory. They kind of kept trying to be very entrepreneurial. But whatever they did, people would say, you know, Upal Saab is rich enough, but he's still sending his girls out to work. And they were totally frustrated, you know. And one of them had beer bottles under her bed, which I was horrified at at the time, I remember. Um, and they were super smart girls, and they became the inspiration for Bride and Prejudice years uh, later. Like mm. these girls were sort of trapped in what society thinks of them, but they're super smart. Um, so India and, and me have had this sort of uh, relationship that is uh, different, you know. Um, but coming to Britain, my main, uh, I guess what my main motivation always is, it always comes down to prejudice, really, and um, finding ways to tell stories that challenge prejudice. And even though everyone thinks Bend It Like Beckham is a great comedy about an Indian girl who wants to play football, it's really, uh, at its core, a film about racism and what the father went through when he came to Britain and uh, not allowed to join the cricket club uh, which is a similar story to what happened to my dad um, with his turban and his beard. Um, he, he, was, um, he used to work at Barclays Bank in Kasumu, and even though his father was quite wealthy, he wanted to sort of separate. And so he, he 
came to Britain and in South, or he walked into the branch of Barclays and said, um, you know, I've been working in Barclays in Africa, you know, and he got laughed out and said, we're never going to have someone that looks like you sitting here in the, in the bank, you know, and, and so he ended up becoming a postman. Um, so I grew up with those kind of stories, um, but uh, for me, that generation really, um, they were not, they're not, the way people have depicted them and talk about them is different. So, for example, in the musical that Mira talks about, I was able to expand the parents more. And in, in the Bendit musical, is one of my favorite songs is the parents' song. Uh, and the first, te the first version was very much, oh, you know, we've struggled to survive. You know, that was the song that was first written. Uh, by um, Howard Goodall and uh, Chris, who wrote? Charles Hart. Charles Hart, even. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I went back to them. I said, this is terrible. You can't, don't see us as victims. We're never victims. We're survivors, you know. And then <laughs> they came back. I gave them some tips. I said, this is what my parents think is hugely successful in their lives. Um, the fact that when they first came to Britain, they would have chicken once a week, you know. Now they can have chicken, lamb, every day of the week, you know. <laughs> like, that's the measure of the success for them, you know, having abundance of food. Um, houses with drives, you know, having uh, marble tops or whatever, you know. It's like... Um, so the, in that song, that's what they sing about, you know, look at us now. You know, yes, that was hard, but look at us now, kind of thing. So that's the that's really the space that I inhabit is that space of um, we're not who you think we are. We're actually much more alike than we are separated. Uh, yeah, there's more that unites us than separates us. And then my mission is further fueled by the fact that I never get finance to make films, like. Everyone, I struggle. Even my film that I've just made, I've struggled, struggled. And I'm of the opinion that people should be running to me and giving me money, you know? <laughs> like, I'm like, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, but look how much money I've made for the British film industry. So I'm shocked that people don't run and give me money, to be honest with you. But anyway, it's their loss. Um, but it still hurts, you know, that we have to struggle. Looking at that amazing body of work of all of us, um, it's a tragedy, you know. And um, in terms of um, going forward, what I've done is taken that impulse of Bend It to show um, how we are uh, much more alike than different, but I invited you and the whole world to see the world from the perspective of an 18-year-old Sikh Punjabi girl and follow, see why she couldn't follow her dream, but then understand her parents' point of view as well, and therefore get a more enriched idea of what it means to be part of a diaspora. Um, but the real achievement of that film for me was that it spoke to people of all different nationalities and spoke to all kinds of diasporas and and was able to articulate that sense of being part of a diaspora and not necessarily being born in the land of your parents or being raised in the land of your parents but being very rooted in in your culture and sometimes um, when I go to India people uh, accuse me of creating racism by making films that talk about racism and, and I say, well, you're very parochial, you know, you Indians, you're very <laughs> parochial, I say. You think Indian culture exists here. Let me tell you, Indian culture exists in Birmingham and Southall and New York and places like this, and we are bringing Indian culture back to you, and you're doing it with your music. That's all come from us. We've totally changed the music of your film industry. So I think that... Um, that voice of the diaspora is something that, that is mm. going to be my, you know, what I'm interested in. Beautiful. Mm. 
you have you have always said that you want to entertain and engage your audiences. So you know that's what you're talking about exactly. But, yeah. But um, your but historical... still make the points. Still tell the stories. Still evoke that sense of injustice. Um, but at the same time, entertain. For me, that's the key: is to celebrate us at the same time, express some of our frustrations. Your historical films, Viceroy's House and Beecham House, are sumptuous, colorful, and I do believe you try to give the British and Indians equal space. Yeah. Um, both deal with the British in India. Viceroy's House is an epic drama set during the partition. Beecham House is set during colonial times, challenging oppressive social norms. Did Viceroy's House impact your life? Was it personal? As a Brit Punjabi, did it matter to you personally? And I remember when I showed Viceroy's house, you were there, at Film Forum, you had told me an anecdote about meeting the then Prince Charles. And you were about to make another kind of movie. And he told you to go and look up. So can you repeat that to the audience and then tell us about it? So my... Ancestral homeland is Jhelum and Rawalpindi, which is now Pakistan. And so that's why I don't have links with India as such, you know. So, um, so partition has always been a shadow of my family's life, you know. Um, when my grandmother came to live with us, my nanny, you know, she was completely suffering from P PSD still from partition. And we didn't understand that at the time, you know, as kids, because like we would want to watch a soap, Crossroads, you know, at six o'clock used to come on, but that was her time to do part. And, she, you know, the telly had to be off and we'd be like willing her to finish the part, you know, <laughs> do, and we would will her to do the adars fast so we could put the telly on, you know. Uh, and this program had a man on it called David Hunter. He was an actor very tall, Breton looking guy. And whenever he came on telly, my grandmother would go mad. And she'd go, oh, Mina, a Muslimana, a Muslimana. And we go, no, Biji, he's English. And, <laughs> and she'd go, nee, then ni pata, kuriya ko lajate se. You know, all this, because she spoke Patwari Punjabi. Uh, and we would go, you know, what is she talking about? But we, this is, of course, part of my childhood. And any time she watched telly or anything to do with violence, for her, it was partition. You know, she would bring that back. Um, and um, so when the time came, I knew that I did want to make a film about partition at some point. I knew I had to. But also there's a, a, a story of my, my grandfather had built, we were in Kenya, but my grandfather had built a house in Jhelum. Um, and at the time of partition, my daddy was there with some of my chachas and puas who were all young kids. And um, they were, of course, caught up in everything. And one day, a, a, an army truck came and said, get in the van now. And they literally had to get in the van. And they uh, went um, you know, across the border and on the way, my grandma had a little baby girl that died. You know, there was no milk. Um, and the young kids all saw that. Their sister, uh, Tripath was her name. Um, so all that trauma is there with my, you know, with my uncles and my aunts and everything growing up. But so I sort of used that story a little bit in Viceroy's house, you know, that sense of uh, loss. And, um, but all, but, in terms of, so in my family, what happened was my uh, grandfather spent about three years looking for my grandmother in all the camps. He came from Mabasa and he, and he went everywhere and he finally got off the train at Panipat and there were some boys playing and he recognized one of the boys as a friend of my young chacha, Bilu Chachaji, and he, who was seven at the time. And, um, he said, you're Billu's friend. Have you seen Billu? And he said, yes. And he took him through the camp in the back 
and he was reunited with my daddy. And, wow. and uh, <laughs> great. And I tell that story in Viceroy's house a little bit. So I'm still trying to find the joy and celebration in that story. But what happened with Prince Charles was I, I had the rights to freedom at midnight, um, which I thought was the sort of seminal book on partition. Um, and then uh, I met Prince Charles somewhere. <laughs> uh, is that Prince Charles? <laughs> it's King Charles now. Uh, he, he, uh, he I, I said, I'm gonna make a film about your uncle your favorite uncle, and he immediately said, who, who, what, what book are you, what are you basing it on? And I said, Freedom at Midnight. And he said to me, no, that's not the book you need. He said, there's another book by uh, Surinder Singh Sarila called um, Shadow of the Great Gate. He said, you must get that book. That tells you the true story of what happened and how my uncle uh, was set up by the establishment. And I'm in Buckingham Palace looking at him and going, well, if you're not the establishment, who, <laughs> who the hell is the establishment? <laughs> and uh, he doesn't see himself as the establishment, by the way. He's the kind of nutter who grows organic food and, you know. But anyway, uh, he, I went off, found, went to five bookshops, finally found the, the book. And of course, the book is, puts forward an argument saying that um, partition was premeditative. It was the brainchild of um, a few senior politicians at the time, uh, including Churchill. Um, and uh, um, the character that um, Michael plays in the film Ismay, Lord Ismay. Uh, and basically, uh, there's this report in the British Library, which was marked top secret at the time, but of course, 50 years later, is now available. And I, I did a documentary about this, and I go to the British Library and I show you the report and everything. Um, but in it, it the, the argument that it poses is that during the World War II, Britain really couldn't afford to be in India anymore. And one of the main reasons why was the dissidents. So all the Bhagat Singhs and the Gadders and everyone that everyone tries to put down, they actually had had a massive impact on the British and they could no longer police the country safely because they were all being blown up left, right and center, right? Um, and so they had to try and find a way to get out with saving face. Uh, the other thing that was going on was the world map was changing. You know, Russia was very powerful and they needed a stronghold in Asia, but they, um, but they knew they had to leave India now, but they still needed to be in Asia somehow. And so the opportunity arose with Jinnah this is, you know, um, this is all in the book uh, by Sarila. Sarila was ADC to Mountbatten. Um, uh, basically, the idea was that they did the deal with Jinnah to say, yes, we'll support you uh, to have your own country, but then your country, uh, we will have our military bases there and it will be our strategic point in India. And so that was the story I then started to tell because I was fascinated by that. Um, and uh, and Sarila, uh, Sarila Sarila helped me with all the research because I kept questioning it and and you know wanted to make it as rigorously you know truthful as possible. But it was actually King Charles who initially mentioned the book. But then, as we all know, you know, in 1953, I think the um, um, a, a, an American pilot, Gary Powers, was shot down taking photos of Soviet airspace, mm -hmm. uh, of camps, and it was a U-2 bomber. And suddenly the world was, how the hell did he get to Soviet airspace? And then people realized there were American bases in Pakistan, and he had actually set off from Pakistan. So to me, that vindicated that story. 
Um, but I did have a conversation with Imran Khan about this. <laughs> <laughs> And Imran was, no, 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 no. <laughs> he said, the people voted for Pakistan. <laughs> and to some degree, you know, one has to also listen to his perspective. But this is what's so interesting, making films about history. You know, history is open to interpretation. And for me, I wanted to tell a story of why my family suffered and why I don't have a homeland and uh, it's give voice to the trauma that my family suffered. And, um, and so that's why I made Viceroy's House. <laughs> so we're not, we're not yeah. even answering your questions. We're it's going fine. off on fine. This was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. It did actually answer it and gave us more. You deal with prejudice against interracial marriages. Well, maybe not you, but you, it comes across. With a world of marginalized outsiders, with new ways to make uncomfortable situations palatable. I'm referring to bride and prejudice. I know you're going to say something about that. <laughs> <laughs> Besides several documentaries addressing issues of prejudice, interracial coupling, lesbian stereotyping, you adapted Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice to a rollicking British Indian Hollywood Bollywood story, Bride and Prejudice, about diversity of race. And then in Chitra Devakaruni, I never get her poor thing, her Devakaruni, name right. Yeah. Mistress. Uh, her Mistress of Spices, you related the purity of power to de heal the world by relating to spices. You have been quoted as saying, filmmakers of color make films to inform. I think I already answered that. Is that, that a truism? Yeah. By the way, Paul directed Mistress of Spices, not me. Sorry? Paul directed Mistress of Spices. Paul not said me. that? Oh, OK. <laughs> Maybe because of you. <laughs> no. No, he, no, it was his film. Yeah. And it's very his film. If it had been my film, it would have been a bit different. But okay. it was very his, much his film, very sweet and... Uh, it was lovely. And lovely, yeah. yeah. The film you're working on at the moment, Christmas Karma, a Bollywood-inspired adaptation... Don't say Bollywood. Ramda Vasta. <laughs> Ramda Vasta. It's not Bollywood. At all. I told you I don't have anything to do with India. <laughs> I'm a British But filmmaker. you love India. Yes, but I'm not a Bollywood okay, director. Okay, nothing to do with Bollywood. None of us are. None of us are. Come on. It's None an of adaptation are. of Charles Dickens' classic A Christmas Carol. I've heard, now this is a rumor, that Scrooge is an Indian Tory who hates refugees. Is that true? <laughs> False? Yes. So... So Christmas Karma is the film that I am making right now. So I just locked the cut last week, which is why I was able to come here. Um, but yeah, it is, it is um, a very uh, tight uh, adaptation of Charles Dickens. It's very true to Dickens, but it's just set today. And my Scrooge is... Um, a very wealthy, uptight Indian who despises refugees and poor people. Well, and it rhymes with Sunak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually was inspired by Priti Patel. Oh, yeah. Oh. Because oh, yeah. I didn't understand her. I couldn't understand her and her politics. And after her, then Rishi yeah. and the Suella thing. and the others all turned up. Yeah. But it was really pretty Patel that I couldn't understand, and so I tried to explore that. Um, but the film has morphed into something which I'm super happy about, because like everybody, you know, we're worried about repeating ourselves, right? And it's the film that's most like Bend It, in that it's very uh, British, Asian, as we say, um, and... Uh, Kunal Nair plays Scrooge, so from Big Bang Theory, and he's amazing. I mean, I just take my hat off to him, like having been stuck in that sitcom for so long, <laughs> and now you see him, no one's gonna even recognize him. It's a transformation, um, such a great performance. So he plays this quite av avuncular person, um, 
And then over the course of the film, the obviously uh, the ghosts come as per Dickens. Hugh Bonneville plays Marley. Um, Eva Longoria plays the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> Very much as in Day of the Dead, Mexican. So it's a lot, lot of Spanish in the film. So, but when, he, when she takes him to his past, we find ourselves in 1972, Uganda, and he's about to be expelled by Idi Amin and uh, with his family, and he comes to Britain as a refugee where there is terrible racism, demonstrations when the refugees came. Um, you know, the National Front was out in force. So as a kid, we see him uh, experience that. And then, of course, 70s, he gets packy bashed, which happened a lot in Britain. So a lot of Asians just beaten up for the sake of it by skinheads. And he learns that money will protect him and give him status. And he feels that to become wealthy and have money in Britain uh, protects him from racism and puts him part into another group who he thinks accepts them. I don't personally think they do, but a lot of these people do. And so the journey of the film is that he has to learn empathy and kindness. And he's taught this through the Cratchits, who are a very typical English family, as per Dickens, have a child who has an illness. Um, in Dickens' day, it was rickets. Today, we've done a, a contemporary disease called NF1 which a lot of kids have, where they did develop tumours on the ends of their nerves, and you have to always monitor whether the tumours are benign or not. And the little kid who plays Tiny Tim actually has NF1, and he actually has some tumours in his... So we went down that route, made it very authentic. And so it transcends race and being a Tory or whatever and becomes very human because his family is very poor and they can't afford the treatment that the kid needs. And so he experiences that journey and learns, as Dickens teaches us, um, you know, who's more important, a sick child or a rich CEO? You know, uh, how should society function with such extremes of haves and have nots? Um, and, and what is the way forward? So what I'm hoping with the film is that Somewhere along the line, initially it's very funny and it's a musical and you get caught up in it all. And then when you, re when you go to Uganda and you see that he's a refugee, suddenly it becomes extremely relevant to everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, and then the audience then is being asked to take some uh, responsibility for what is going on, what happened to him, uh, and are we happy to create people like him? in our society. Mm. So now we all start watching the film going, oh my God, you've got to change, you've got to change. In my interest, you have to change. How are you going to change? And this is the brilliance of Dickens, you know, because mm. we're all willing him to change, but by making him Indian and giving him this background and talking about race, it really becomes a film about um, how do we, who live in the West, you know, as part of a diaspora, how do we uh, deal with racism and overcome racism and um, in, for the good of the entire community. And Billy Porter uh, plays the ghost of Christmas present um, who carries a lot of this message with him uh, and tries to teach him and in instruct him on how you have to rise up and don't let hate define who you are. Um, and all this has come from the fact that when my son was eight at school um, he was um, with some friends and uh, and an English boy said to him uh, your skin is the color of poo and another English boy said to the English boy once and you can't say that it's racist and he said it's not racist it's true look at the color and then these boys had this discussion about it and then all the other boys joined in and they kind of did an intervention, right, at age eight. Uh, this is in a North London school. And then my son told me about it. And I said, what do you think? And he said, I don't know. 
I don't know because I don't understand. And I said, well, when the boy said it, did you feel bad? And he said, yes. And I said, well, that's racism, you know. Um, so I had to have that conversation with him at age eight. So that always stayed with me. So this is a film really for my kids and to empower them yeah. and their friends. Not just them, it's actually to empower their Gora friends as well. <laughs> because we live in a society now which is not dichotomous, which is, yeah. you know, many white people are superb anti-racists, you know. Many people of my skin color are hideously racist, you know. <laughs> so it's a, I've blurred the boundaries in, in this, and it's a Christmas film, so. <laughs> and there's a Bhangra song in it as well, as a Christmas film. <laughs> Thank you, Gurinder. Okay, now Let's we've just it got a very little, no. Do we have time? <laughs> we need to wrap up. We can't chat with all three. No, please. 10 minutes? OK. It's 8.30. Minutes. It's 8.30? Yeah. Oh, Why don't dear. we open it up? You don't, three of you don't want to no. chat? No, no. Let's, let's, just let's open, open it up. Let's open it up. OK. Just two or three questions, because we're late. From the audience. Yeah. From the audience. Uh, Rachel, are you? Where's Rachel? Yeah. Oh, here we are. Rachel, will you? I can't Only see. good questions, please. <laughs> because if they're boring, we're all three of us going to say, next. <laughs> No, I think we no, should open it up. They don't want to. They want to ask the no. audience. Yeah. Yeah. Let's open it up. Three. Pressure's on. <laughs> OK. Three questions, yeah. Then drinks. Hi, my question is for Gurinder. How did you get Beckham to come in your movie? Where is this? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good one. Next. Um, you know what? When we f it took me so long to get the film financed that when we first approached Beckham, he was a nobody. He was just this young guy playing in Manchester United, going out with a Spice Girl, and we said, we're making this film about women and soccer, and he said, oh, that's a good idea. I'd like to see more women coming to the game. I'd like to see more families coming. Here, you can use my name. And um, by the time the film came out, he was Brand Beckham. And suddenly, all his people were like, well, you can't do this. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so that's how, but, but there is a calmer side to this. When I came to America to promote the film, nobody knew who David Beckham was. <laughs> and Fox Searchlight wanted to change the title of the film. And it was only because we couldn't think of a better title that we stayed with it. And I remember doing an interview with the Washington Post, and the guy said to me, who is Beckman? Why, why Beckman? And everyone was, like, getting it wrong. And then somebody said, oh, he's the cute soccer guy who goes out with the Spice Girl. And so that, those were the questions, the press questions at the time. However, because after the success of the film, David then did that $250 million deal with Galaxy, which I take full credit for. Thank you very much. <laughs> But we are talking about doing a sequel to Bend It. Um, so I'm sure David will be involved in that in some way. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I see many hands. Hi. Uh, so my question is about uh, public transportation and how that is. Mm -hmm. This is for Ms. Nair, uh, since you worked in Kolkata. And uh, how important do you think uh, public transportation is for talking about a city's essence, and what would you say about the trams disappearing from the streets of Kolkata now? <laughs> what? Trams? Trams. Trams. Oh, trams. <laughs> That's a great what? question yeah. for the reception after. <laughs> yes. While Mira can think of the answer, Hana. Huh? Um, well, <laughs> public transportation, it makes me sound like my, my father's portfolio or something. <laughs> But, uh, well, but Kolkata, as you mentioned, <laughs> has extraordinary and different forms of public transportation. The hand-carrying rickshaw to the tram to the... Uh, and that is a part of Calcutta that's slowly slipping. And, uh, but 
I, I must say that is the part that I go for because in like the subways in New York, that's the real face of the, the citizens of, of the city. So I didn't know it was disappearing, but it's definitely uh, the, like a pulse, like the nerve, nerve of the city. Yeah, sorry about that. Good answer. <laughs> last question. Yeah. One more. Rachel, is that the last question? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry. Go this for question it. is for any and all of you. Um, as you have been in the industry creating um, and growing with it and also sort of like creating what it is now, how are you seeing it change? How are you seeing Indian and Indian diasporic artists making their own mark? Are you seeing changes? Are you seeing like funding changes? Are you optimistic? Are you, I don't know, I'm just curious about your take. Well, I, I am certainly seeing change uh, in the confidence of the, of, the, of the South Asian cool, you could say, or the, or the diaspora, whatever you put it to it. I'm really seeing um, a few um, very, very interesting films, certainly extraordinary music, and uh, also incredible, incredible painting, you know, and art generally. And I think that that's uh, you know gives me a lot of uh, fervor. I I was saying to someone that there is a lesser loneliness, you know, yeah. uh, because it's I feel like there's there's this, there are people out there who I don't have to explain my explain myself to, you know, and not just that, not to do only with myself, but also to see the great quality of work, you know. So that's pretty exciting. And sometimes I'd say it's even more exciting than being in India and seeing what the public and the, and the fodder that is constantly being asked to be made, especially with the streamers. You know, it's just, it went from a time of interesting, really interesting work to just, I would call it fodder, you know. So that's something that is being challenged now by the South Asian diaspora. I have a fear. Uh, which is uh, about tokenism and DEI and how much. And I was talking to some young kids, uh, fabulous, brilliant young filmmakers, and they said, you know, the window is open now and we can go through it. And I said, yes, you must go through it, but don't ever forget who holds the window. And uh, I think that's something that is really important we remember. And never let us be tokens. I really would request that. When we were first sitting up outside before the talk, I said to Arun, I said, the question that really we should ask is how have we survived, the three of us, yes. in, an, in a climate where we have to fight and struggle to get finance. To this day, despite the body of work, we still have to struggle. And I think that, um, um, you know, we have, we need our own community to be a lot more supportive of us in terms of, yes. in terms of finance. And, you know, we have many, many wealthy uh, Indians <laughs> around the world who've done very well. And we have brought you a lot of pleasure. Uh, <laughs> And you need to put your money where your mouth is. Um, and it, on that note, in Christmas Karma, which again was a film that I couldn't get financed, um, I, 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 I um, had a, my UK distributor was on board. That was great. I had an Indian company put up some of the equity, uh, an Indian woman, Anushka, from Civic. Um, and then I was struggling for the rest of the equity. And I did a talk, uh, I, did a, I read a poem uh, for the Anti-Slavery Society last Christmas, um, and I'd agreed to do it, it was for my lawyer who's retired now, Sunil, and I agreed to do it, and I went down, did the talk, and after he came up to me and said, so what are you doing? I said, I'm really struggling to get this film made, it's so good. I've paid myself, I've paid to shoot London at Christmas time, did my own shoot, because I believed in it so much. But now, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. And he said, well, how much do you need? And I said, well, I need about a million and a half. I actually needed more, but I didn't want to frighten him. So I said, about a million and a half. And he said, OK, uh, 
let me come back to you. And then the next day, Sunil called me, Sunil Seth, Seth his name is, he called me, he said, Gurinder, a few of my friends and I, we've got together and we're all going to put in money because we all want to support you and I've got your money. And I'm like, wow. So the only reason my film has happened is because of Sunil going and, and the Asian community around the world all coming together to form a consortium to make it happen. And I would urge people who know people to create a studio. We need to create our own studio. So all these voices, all these people who are, that can benefit from the work we've done can find it much easier to tell those stories because we are a cinema loving community, culture, you know, and don't, don't, we can't rely on others to tell our stories. It's that simple. We can't. Thank you, all three of you, fabulous, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.